to recap, going back a couple weeks. I've been talking about the ventral visual pathway that goes down into the temporal lobe as opposed to the dorsal pathway that goes up into the parietal lobe. And we talked about how the ventral pathway is involved in recognizing things like faces and objects and places, okay? And so I showed you this schematic of a bunch of regions in the brain that are specialized for features like um, color and um, motion over there in uh, blue and, um, and shape in here, as well as other regions nearby uh, that are selectively responsive to specific categories of stimuli like faces, places, and bodies, okay? So this is just part of the functional organization of the bottom of the brain uh, that subserves high-level vision in humans, okay? And so these things um, are fa were found first with functional MRI. It's not quite true. They're found with functional MRI that shows their selective activation for these categories of uh, features and stimuli. But there's, course, there's um, complementary data um, from patients with brain damage that dovetails beautifully with these functional MRI studies, showing selective deficits in shape perception when people have lesions right there in the region that responds to shape, selective deficits in face perception called prosopagnosia that result when lesions land in this region right on top of the face area, selective deficits in color perception called achromatopsia that land when there are lesions in that vicinity where the color region is, um, and um, selective deficits in motion perception called akinetopsia when you have lesions over here uh, on top of area MT that's specialized for processing visual motion, okay? Um, so those, as I've been saying many times in this class, selective deficits from brain damage are importantly complementary to activation studies with functional MRI because they show those regions don't just turn on specifically to certain kinds of stimuli. They are necessary for processing those stimuli. You lose those from a stroke or other kind of brain damage, you're screwed. You cannot process that uh, feature dimension or that category of stimuli, okay? There's another kind of um, deficit that can result from damage to, uh, to these regions, um, and that is something called topographic disorientation. And topographic disorientation is what Bob had. Bob, who I talked about in the story on the first day of class. Bob, who has a hell of a time getting around in the world and wouldn't be able to do it at all if not for his iPhone, um, because he presumably has some kind of disruption of his navigation system presumably including uh, the PPA, okay? Um, there are quite a number of different versions of topographic disorientation that differ slightly. Some people just can't recognize familiar places. You show them a photograph of the front of their house or other very well-known buildings, and they know it's a building, they can describe the building, they can see it just fine. They do not know which building it is. That's quite analogous to prosopagnosia. People with prosopagnosia know they're looking at a face, they just don't know who that is. Okay, so this is like prosopagnosia for landmarks and buildings and places, okay? In other versions of it, actually the version Bob has, he recognizes familiar places. He knows that's my house, that's my friend's house, that's my bank, that's my whatever. He can do that just fine. But looking at that picture, he can't say, which way would you turn to go to this other familiar location? which all of you presumably can do just fine, okay? Okay, so there are multiple different versions of topographic disorientation that seem to disrupt subtly different aspects of the navi navigation system. And this is one of this, these fascinating big literatures that I had to ax to fit in today's lecture, but maybe I'll sneak it in at the end of class, at the end of the, the course, yeah. So the reason that you can remember like the house, the bank, because it's stored as like memories, so it's stored somewhere else. Um, well, it's not just that it's memory, um, because of course, when you're looking at the bank, it's also memory to know what direction is it from there to get to this other place. And also his memory for faces and objects and other things is fine. So it's a pretty specific, um, um, the people who have the, the inability to recognize case, um, you know, just, just don't know how to match that to historic representation. Okay, so this is sort of recap leading into um, another uh, review slide. I talked a bunch last time about the parahippocampal place area. I spent a lot of time talking about 
how one can um, do experiments to unpack the function of a region by kind of tri triangulating and testing hypothesis after hypothesis. And the upshot of all of that is here's the PPA in a slice like this in four different people. Um, and here's a sort of schematic of what it responds to. It responds to all different kinds of scenes, doesn't care if they're indoor or outdoor, doesn't care if they're familiar or unfamiliar. It responds more to those than lots of different kinds of control stimuli, like objects and faces and scrambled scenes and so forth. Okay, so that shows a selective response to scenes and especially uh, with evidence like this case here, the fact that it responds just as much to an empty room as a complex scene full of objects suggests that it's specifically interested in the spatial layout of your surrounda surroundings, where the navigational barriers are and where the walls are and what shape of, of space you're in. Okay, and this idea will recur um, multiply through today's lecture. Okay, so that's the PPA. 